So we're resuming part two to the private workshop, uh, 51 minutes in, and I've got the chat open. So answer me this. Uh, well, I guess ask me this. What do you want to talk about? Do you want to talk about uh, Forex? Do you want to talk about the macro environment? You want me to do some technical analysis? You want to talk about stocks and options? Just curious uh, where you'd like me to start. Um, I mean, usually my, my routine is uh, dollar index, oil, gold, silver, Bitcoin, do some spot checking, um, Forex, stocks, earnings, indexes. That's pretty much what I do. So um, I try to cover a lot of ground in the live sessions as far as the, 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 the top to bottom or the drill down approach. You know, once I get a feel for macro for the day and I get a feel for flow of the day, you know, risk on, risk off, I am looking for something along those lines. I mean, today was the type of day. Today was interesting. Uh, if I get to my, you know, this is one of my bigger portfolios that I look after. Uh, today it showed that I was down on the day. I know that I took some realized losses with um, Raza's. What do you got there, Raza? I, Sean says 4X. Okay, that's fine. Uh, Raza, where'd, where'd that little hand raise go? Were you just asking me something? Okay. Um, I was going to say, so today, if I look at my positions, you know, P&L for the day, it was kind of a crappy day, right? Like on the day it was crappy, but then I look at all these, it's like, okay, so I've got 350. I mean, I've got a couple thousand dollars down here. Some of these that are a lot of sell options that I still need more time to K. But as far as, you know, today was a, was a stingy, uh, you know, index trade, but this wiped away, you know, maybe eight or nine trades. This wiped away eight or nine trades of profit, but that's okay because of, let's say I do a hundred trades, I'm probably going to win 80 of them. You know, if I win 80 of them, and every time I lose, I wipe away, you know, 20 and I wipe away eight of them. It's, it's okay. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's not ideal, but, um, obviously I try to make the highest percent. What I could do is I could have managed earlier. Uh, it's kind of, it's difficult to do sometimes with broken butterfly, but also my lesson here was having a 25 and 50 point wide butterfly spread, not ideal. I think I need to keep it tighter. Uh, I can't go out as far. I like to, uh, just because I'm, I'm confident in some of the areas, but this trade, not exactly where I wanted to trade it. I should have done, I should have done this on the NDX. I'm just throwing this out there. Um, I should have done this on the NDX where, um, we're trading up to, you know, 18091. If I put an expiration here at 18500 or 18470. Uh, that would have been a better trade ahead. I, you know, just asked for 50 cents to a dollar credit and just taking the trade there. So I got, I got a little greedy with thinking, you know, I did a Friday trade and I put on a Tuesday expiration, you know, yesterday it would have been okay. Um, yes. If I go to the daily chart here, oops, the daily chart yesterday, we closed. Uh, so yesterday we closed around 18093. Today we closed around the same price. Now, one thing I'm looking at from the technical side on the QQQ, this will be interesting. This is my analysis. So, um, who remembers talking about this? Um, was this the price? Let me see something here. I know I had a trade right there. Um, or was that on the DIA or was that the spy? One of the, one of these indexes was like perfectly, yeah, it was this one. It was the spy. Once we broke this trend line, we gapped, retested, dumped, you know? So, I mean, at this point, it's like, we're probably going to close higher for the week. I don't see why the market's going to dump all of a sudden, unless earnings are just terrible for the next couple of days. Uh, but then we have CPI next week. And I would imagine that lower inflation is going to get priced in. Um, I'm not going to short the market. I mean, I'm more interested in if we're getting a pullback here, I'd probably look for a chance to revisit the highs, you know, coming into CPI next week that might get the market all excited. Um, if IV doesn't improve, then I might just stay out of the market as far as index plays. Because one thing that bothers me is having this SPX at a 15, a 15 IV rank, I can't get enough premium to sell it. I literally looked at a trade today. I was 20 points away from the price. So I was 20 points out of the money and it was offering me five cents today.
on on a on a you know a, a 5 10 15 20 point spread it was ridiculous so um anyway uh yeah Larry this is recording I'm recording this for sure yep so I will admit Arthur can come on in all right so anyway that's that um but I own some shares of Chewy. I have some long trades in synthetics on Pfizer, trying to keep the buying power uh, low and just keep trading. So that's the name of the game. Just keep trading. Uh, all right. So let's talk Forex for a second. And Sean, you said Forex. Um, again, I, I'm open. Let's let's say that we're going to go for another like 30 to 45 minutes or so. What are we doing? You need some directional guidance. I mean, I think a lot of you know where I stand on Forex right now. If you've been following it all for the last, you know, five months, I'm still involved in the carry trade. Um, I'm still uh, long against the Swiss. Those are, those are to me right now, my favorite, absolutely favorite currency pairs is to be long against the Swiss. So Aussie Swiss, CAD Swiss, Euro Swiss, Pound Swiss, New Zealand Swiss. I'm not, I'm not trading Swiss yen. I don't want to trade the Swiss yen. Okay. If I'm just going to, if I'm going to hold... I'm going to hold everything against the Swiss except for the Swiss or the, uh, the Swiss yen, right? That's still my favorite trade. If, if, if you want me to give you what I think is my favorite trade of the year, I'm just trading long against the Swiss basket, you know, and, and there's not really a timeline on it. I've been in this trade since last year. Uh, a lot of it is this. I'm just buying dips. If I get a decent push and a pullback, I'm trying to buy a dip. I'm getting a decent push and pullback. I'm trying to buy a dip. If it doesn't trend and we go sideways, I'm buying lows and I'll buy the lows and I'll buy the lows and I'll buy the lows and I can I can scalp that as a range or I can accumulate more in my position and then look for a higher move. To me, this is our bottom and I'm looking to see how I can get a five wave move out of this. And because we had all these lows right here, all these lows to me, this is wave one. To me, this is wave one. I don't know if I would say that wave is two because that's a pullback. That's a that's a tricky one for sure. But if we're going to push up here to wave three, wave four, wave five, realistically, I think we can get back to like 6,400, maybe 6,500 on the Aussie Swiss. We're trading at 59.90. I mean, if I want to look at a simple trade, what is simpler than I'm going to be long for the next 500 pips and not worry about it? <laughs> I, I love that trade. You know, so for me, the Swiss is is really, really good. Um, can you go over silver? Yep, for sure. Yep. So Swiss pairs are my favorite right now um, by by a long shot. I mean, I just it, it's it's positive swap, number one. And so I'm up. Um, I mean, I'm in my master accounts. I'm up thousands of dollars in positive swap, which is freaking awesome because it all started in 2023. I was starting to get long the Swiss way before it became a popular trade. I was early. And I was sitting in drawdowns, but not extreme, probably like a 2 to 3% drawdown for most of my accounts. Now they're all sitting in profit, and the positive swap has kind of wiped away a lot of the trouble. And now we're just getting paid to hold. you know. And so that swap for me is somewhere between like 3 and 4%. Because you got a 1.75 or 1.5 on the Swiss. That's the official cash rate. And then you have uh, everything against it. The Aussies at 4.35. Okay, the CADs at 4.5. Or, or 5%, I don't remember. I think they're at 4.5. Uh, CB rates. Uh, CAD's at 5. Yeah, so, okay, let's do the differences here. So, you've got the Aussie. Uh, Aussie Swiss is a 4.35 minus 1.50. CAD Swiss, will somebody do the math on this for me? 5 minus, obviously I can figure out some of it on my own. Uh, Euro Swiss is going to be 4.50 minus 1.5. That's pretty simple. I think Eurozone's still there for you. Yep. And then pound is 5.25 minus 1.5. New Zealand is 5.5 because uh, that matches the U.S. minus 1.5. And then the uh, USD Swiss is, I'm going to take the low end of the side because it's 5.25 to 5.5. I'll take the low end minus 1.5. So you're looking at numbers here. Um, this one is going to be, I guess I'll just add this up here. Um, so you're looking at, what is that? 2.85, 2.85% on that one. You're looking at a 3.5 difference here. So this is, this is the positive swap, by the way. So this, this obviously takes an annualized return. Okay. But if I do nothing but hold this, I'm making some pretty good return just on holding. And the best part is, is it's not, look, I'm not interested in this just by itself. OK, I'm interested in this in addition to getting the technicals to line up where I get positive swap, get paid to hold and 
have my pips going in my direction. So not only do I get positive swap for holding, but I get, let's say, 500 pips of directional movement that I can just hold a position and add to it and turn these into much bigger winning trades. Okay, uh, this one is what? 3.75. So that's a plus 3.75 percent. And this one is a 4 percent. And this one is a uh, plus 3.75 to 4 percent. Okay, so let's add up those numbers and find roughly my average swap uh, with the Swiss crosses. So right now, 2.85 plus 3.5 plus 3.0 plus 3.75 plus 4 plus 3.75. And like I said, I'll take the low end of the dollar Swiss uh, divided by six currencies. So I'm getting an average of about 3.47% positive yield on these positions and have the technical kicker on top of that. Does that make sense? So if I can get my position to give me, if I take a, you know, to me, this is I'm willing to take about a 5% risk of my entire account to take this trade um, because the, the odds of hitting 5% and having a cutoff, it's, it's not going to stop me out all at one spot. If, if I take losses, they're going to be fractional, 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 small, 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 and I'll stay in this trade and build it back up. I, I'm, I'm very committed to this trade overall. Now, this is investing in Forex. But if somebody came to me, and this I've done this with the last couple of courses I've done with market traders, uh, Hypertrend, buy only on the Swiss. Uh, Six Figure Ultimate, buy only on the Swiss. Flex Room Portfolio Builder, we're just buying the Swiss. It makes my job a lot easier. These trades are going really well. We're managing like six or 7,000 pips of profit right now in open P&L. And there's going to be another five or 6,000 pips easy. Because if we go another three, four, 500 pips of direction, and I'm in five trades on this currency pair and five trades on this currency pair and 10 trades on this currency pair, there's thousands of pips that are still out there. All right? So that's the best trade that I have. I, I have been stalking this trade for literally years. And I've been taking action on it the last couple of years. As soon as positive swap hit in 2023, I'm in. And I've been building, I've been building, and it's going my way. So the pips are nice, managing some profit, and there's a lot more upside still. I'm not done. Okay? But what it does require for many of you that are watching this, it requires a lot of patience. Okay? I have a lot of patience. Forex trading for me has been a lot easier over the years than me uh, not trying to trade short term. I, I, you know, I, I can take a couple swing trades here and there. I'll line up a high probability pivot and pocket trade here and there. Uh, I build positions for the most part until I take these big profit chunks. That's how I make money in Forex most of the time. I have robots running in the background. I don't really worry. I don't worry about the robots. They're try they're trading small. To me, they're they're designed to make me little bonuses. You know, if my robots help me make an extra fifteen thousand dollars a year, twenty thousand dollars a year, awesome. But my Forex trading like this, like this account, I'm trying to make like a hundred grand on my master account, and that translates into uh oh fudge it's gonna be it's gonna be close to like a million dollars in my in my uh, client accounts so it's a big deal so i don't take it lightly you know it's not like i'm just like oh, i'm just casual and i don't really like the trade it's like this is what i'm focused on this to me is way more important that i do this right but the nice thing is i don't have to be super price sensitive so i can i can take the time to take the trades i can i can you know day to day it's like I don't freak out if it's a pullback. I'll just wait and I'll assess and make sure we're doing okay. We're not breaking structure and, you know, pick my battles. But keep the trade size small and build up positions. That's what it's all about. Okay? So, to me, that's that's my Forex stuff. And that is the best trade that I have. Everything else, I think the dollar, I mean, the dollar was really strong today. Um, I think I can get rid of this. This was a trading battle. I can get rid of this workspace now. Um, I'm going to get rid of this indicator here. So previous week's range, that is a, that's a good one to keep handy. Um, I'm not sure why it, oh, that's the extended trading hours. We'll go regular trading hours. There we go. Put this back on and put this one back on. I like those. So this is the high, low close by weekday opening bell breakout. Um, let me see this one really quickly. Number of weeks back, 10. So this is Monday to Friday. Okay, so the good thing is here, I can keep this indicator and then also see if it breaks the weekly range. Which So it breaks weekly range, and the odds of this are 
So if we break the weekly range, this is just back to what Andrew was talking about. If we break the weekly range, the odds of coming back to this low are slim. The problem is I'd love to be selling my options down here, but the problem is I'm probably going to get garbage for that premium in a week. You know, I, I can guarantee that if I did, if price is at 515 or 512 and I do a 500, the odds of getting good premium there is crap. Um, but if it was trading for a, you know, low enough delta, maybe I just do a naked put and then I, I don't know. It, it's, it's tough, but there's, there's ways to figure it out. I just think it's interesting with what this indicator can show. All right, that's that. Uh, so we're good on the Swiss pairs. We're good on some Forex stuff. Dollar crosses are really choppy. Um, the dollar was strong today. That's what I was talking about. So here's still my analysis on the dollar. I still think the dollar has room to be supported. And I still think the dollar has room to elevate. Um, if this is a weird year where the equities market goes up and commodities go up, gold goes up, silver goes up, dollar goes up, that is a wild and crazy year of everything going up. That truly would be like the Goldilocks year with everything appreciating. Now, commodities, I think, can only go up so far because that's going to be a problem. If we have commodity prices rallying and rising, that does become an issue for the Fed. That becomes an issue for the dollar. Um, that becomes an issue for a lot of global trade, right? Supply and demand can be thrown off by higher prices on these commodities. So it's, it's going to be an interesting balance of supply and demand in oil. Uh, demand is certainly very high in, in gold. We have like, I mean, we have central banks around the world that are buying gold like crazy. Um, and I think they're trying to do that to have it be an alternative from just taking on U.S. debt. Right now, like the U.S. is just pumping short-term debt, short-term debt, short-term debt. And eventually they're going to have to, you know, write it down. Eventually you're going to have to make good on short-term debt. But long-term debt right now is financed at, you know, sub 5%, 4.5%. Um, as rates are possibly being cut later in this year, providing inflation data cooperates, everything's going to go down. Right. If, if two years go down, if three months go down, if one years go down, 10 years are going to stay more elevated. We'll get back from instead of having an inverted yield curve, we'll finally we'll get uh, we'll get you know back to normal. But that's always a sign within like a one to two year period that inverted yield curve has been a pretty good indicator for a recession. Um, I do think a recession is around the corner. It might be 2025 with the new administration. It might be a lot of reality checks the market has to go through. Um, overall, it could still be a global growth slowdown. So I think in that event, let's say that we go from these, you know, gangbuster years. And, in, I mean, the U.S. is essentially a tech industry. If you look at it, like U.S. tech is outperforming everything. If you're looking for growth, U.S. tech is crushing it. Um, I still think it's not everybody. I think it's the best of the best that are crushing it. And that's the hard part is it's so it feels like so few companies are actually crushing it. It's, you know, it, it's been Apple and Amazon and it's been, um, you know, uh, Amazon. I said Amazon. It's been, um, I was thinking Alphabet, so Google and Microsoft. It's been those four, right? And then you sprinkle in an NVIDIA and an SMCI and you sprinkle in some semiconductors. That's seven to 10 stocks that have, you know, grown enough and accelerated enough that it's moving the broader markets, right? I mean, the, the, the year's best performer so far in the S&P is SMCI still as it was added into the S&P. And video is one of the top performers the last 15, 20 years. Um, you know, Apple's struggling with international growth, so they offered a crazy buyback program that's, you know, you can't refuse it. So if you're a shareholder, you're like, fine, I'll take a record buyback program. Um, just figure out your crap, you know? So anyway, um, yes. So I, I do think that this year could be really, really interesting where there's not a lot of disruption. And that's my point is I know we have a lot of noise to contend with. I know we have geopolitical concerns and escalations. I know we have a dramatic election that's going to happen later this year. All that's going to be something that we're going to have to figure out how to navigate, whether it's easy, whether it's not. I think the eye on the prize is this market doesn't care about a lot of that stuff right now. I think this market cares about getting to a destination and pricing in the reality later. That's what we saw in 2020, uh, 2020, 2021, 2022. You can see that this market does that a lot. It doesn't care about a lot of stuff. I mean, there were, there were smart people that were becoming like macro bears in 2020 and 2021, and they got it wrong for two straight years. And then they finally got to say like, see, I told you in 2022. But you know how much money you missed out on 
being stubborn and being directional and being biased like that in 2020 and 2021. I mean, I, I doubled and tripled accounts in 2020 and 2021 because it was, it was the, the bazooka trade. It's like everything was at 10 year discounts, have the courage to put all your buying power out there, be fully invested. And it was a fantastic run. 2022 was challenging. It was a good inflation trade for the first half of the year, but it was it was very difficult to hide late 2022 when everything was down. Bonds were down a lot. Stocks were down a lot. Uh, every sector was down a lot. There was nowhere to hide. There was no safe haven. You can hide out in currencies, right? End of 2022, you had the big Japanese yen movement, right? Because during 2022, you had a weaker yen. And then end of 2022 and 2023, you had a crazy uh, retracement in the end, right? Um, yeah, so Sean says, I see why you're firm on direction, playing off. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm just, I just don't think there's going to be a lot to disrupt the market. That's all. And and right now, I mean, I, I do think the dollar is messy. I think the dollar is going to be tricky. But until my structure breaks right here, until my dollar is below 103.90 or 103.85, I'm still, I'm still fairly bullish on dollar crosses. Now, I said this today in my live session. I do think that to be long the dollar, it's probably better paired against the euro, against the pound, and against the CAD. I'm already long dollar Swiss. I'm already long dollar yen because those are carry trades right now. But euro dollar, pound dollar, dollar CAD, those to me are more directional. Because if those central banks, I mean major economies, if the euro cuts this summer, it's going to make the dollar more attractive for a, a solid two, three, four, five months, right? We don't know if the Fed's going to cut rates in September. I, I, I think they're planning on it. The market certainly sniffs it out and senses it. But if they don't, for whatever reason, if they don't cut rates in September and they don't cut rates at all this year, the dollar is going to be what looks good, right? And and it will continue to be like resilient and probably the, the more attractive yielding currency until the market wants to run the other way with it, you know? So uh, we saw this today in the flex room, by the way. Uh, Denise had posted this. I, you can't really see the font, but I'll just tell you what it is. Uh, this is cuts and probabilities. This is posted. Uh, this is through Financial Juice, which I did put that in my Discord, by the way. There's a real-time channel now that's running with live news. So I hope that helps. That's just a bunch of different random media outlets that are just putting in financial news. So it keeps the Discord channel. I know it's very active because it's it's probably popping, you know, 30, 40, 50 messages. But I, please don't let that be like, oh, all this is is a news feed. It's like, I post every day in Discord. That's the best place to find me every single day. So if you want to reach out to me personally, you're in my Discord channel. That's where I'm at. That's the easiest way to reach me directly, right? So anyway, I put the real-time news in there so we can follow along and, and find some whys and what happens in the market. Um, but what this is showing us is that Bank of England, ECB, Bank of Canada are probably going to be the three central banks to cut first probably the summer june july august that's the window for those cuts now it's interesting that the fed is at the later stage of those and the fed would be like maybe that first cut in september right by 25 basis points so if everybody shifts down by 25 basis points it still makes the dollar more attractive right the rba the rbnz a little bit more of the wild card rbnz is looking at maybe one rate cut coming in august but they're still firm at five and a half percent RBA seems like they're firm at 4.35. They've had inflation. I think I looked at this today, inflation by country. Uh, Central bank stuff. Looked at that inflation by country. Australia, previous pit was three uh, 3.6 for year over year. Their interest rate right now is 4.35. So every currency pair right now is restrictive when it comes to what's their annual inflation rate, what's their rolling 12-month year over year, and what's their, what's their official uh, cash rate. 4.35 is definitely greater than 3.6 with their previous inflation. 5% is definitely greater than 2.9 in Canada. Uh, 4.5 is greater than 2.4 in the Eurozone. All the Eurozone countries, you know, the Euro at 4.5, all of them are lower. I mean, even the, the higher ones like Spain, I think Spain had uh, higher inflation at 3.3. The Euro still at 4.5 is still better. The Bank of England, 5%, 5.25%. 3.2 is their, their year over year. So their inflation has come down in a big way, right? U.S., we're at 5.25, 5 5.5. Last inflation print was 3.5. So we're, quote, restrictive, uh, which gives a little bit of padding to start cutting some rates, a little bit. 
right? Not a lot. I, I think that if we cut rates, you know, 50 basis points or certainly 100 basis points, we run the risk of having that official cash rate come too close to that oscillating inflation. And the scary part is you, you may have seen some information on this. I hear this a lot in the podcast that I consume. There's, there's really never been a one time squash of inflation ever, right? When Volcker raised rates to like obscene teen, like uh, double digit amounts, when it was like 12, 15, 17% interest rates, he did that after a second wave of inflation. So that would be, I mean, that would be a, a repeat legacy if Jerome Powell had to do that with his tenure or whoever the new Fed chair is in 2025. I don't know. But my point is, I do think that the Fed is trying not to repeat that because I do think that if we had to crash the economy like that, if we had to go to, you know, 6%, 7%, 8% interest rates because inflation's ticking up to 4, 4.5%, that's going to be, I mean, you're going to unwind years of gains, I think, and it will be ugly. And man, I can't, I could, I can't wait to be a bear if that's the case. But the reality is, I think the Fed just stays restrictive. They stop just dripping this crap into the market that gets the market all excited and pushes assets higher when the market clearly doesn't let it jawbone anymore. The Fed can't jawbone the markets down like it used to, right? Because now the market's way less interested in inflation because the data's been okay. Also, the Fed is tolerating, you know, they're not raising rates and we're at 3.5% inflation. They're not raising rates. So at 3%, 3.5%, okay, I mean, we're not 2%. We're not even close to 2%. But if we're at 2 to 3%, 2 to 4, 2 to 4%, we're okay at this restricted rate at 5, 5 and a quarter, 5 and a half. Maybe 4 and a half is okay. So again, I, I hate us thinking that it's all about the Fed. But for literally 25, 30 years, if you stay on the correct side of the Fed, you're typically right. And right now the Fed is tilted more neutral to dovish, looking at their done rate or raising rates. The market's finally, you know, in this, in this like clean light of, of no more, no more like overhanging uh, rate hikes. But I don't think they're going to be as quick to, to cut. Um, and if they do cut, it's more of like, I don't know. It's more of like just here's a little nibble that the market's expecting. So there you go. Because the Fed has been forced to be way more transparent since the great financial crisis. So anyway, that's big picture stuff. But there's there's a lot going on. But if I'm going to sum up, you know, this conversation right here, I will say this. I don't think directions are necessarily going to change dramatically, right? The Japanese yen after the intervention we saw last week, we might be stuck in a 700 pip range for a while. Okay, so it gets boring all of a sudden, right? If, if dollar yen is going to be defended at 160 again, if we have another level of intervention, I mean, and we can't control this stuff, everybody. We, we really can't. So the only way that I'm going to turn into a bear on the yen is looking at trend line breaks there. And I'm not, I mean, I might trade the yens in currencies, but my better trade is probably going to be this right here. This is probably my better trade. This is an FXY. This is a currency play. This is an ETF for the Japanese yen. If I buy this thing, okay, if I buy this thing back here around, you know, 59 or $58 and I buy this and hold this, I do want to make sure that there's no, there's no stupid funny games going on here. Um, that it's like, you know, if, if this uh, is repriced like a volatility instrument or like a short-term futures contract, I want to make sure I don't do this. Uh, let's see here. Known for his exposure, the fund offers a simple strategy, holds Japanese yen deposit amount. It's worth noting that there's no deposit insurance on its holdings, so it carries credit risk in its depository. Uh, JP Morgan distribution share sales always taxed at ordinary income rate as opposed to capital gains, regardless of holding period. Uh, in addition, FXY doesn't deliver the overnight lending rate like its benchmark with the interest rates in Japan near zero. That's not much of a drawback. In fact, 0% yield is a boon for those looking to... Uh, to short shares in the fund. Okay, fine. Um, I don't think there's a, there's not a dividend play here, but a couple things I can do. If I feel like the timing is imminent that we're going to see a Japanese yen move, this to me will probably make me more money for my portfolio than just trading the yens. Because I, here's how I'm going to trade Forex. Really freaking small. Like I'll trade Forex with micro lots and I'll build in and I'll scale in and I'll take a stab and I'll have a defined risk and I'll just, I hope that I'm right on the yen. 
and maybe I'll make a couple thousand dollars and that's magnified with larger accounts and I'll, I'll make, you know, I don't know. I could see real, realistically if I'm right, I'll make a couple thousand bucks, which might be five to 10% of my account. Everyone else matches that or with a, with a bit more leverage, there'll be at one and a half that. That's still a good return. Now, what I could do with this is I could trade FXY, which is just this trust. It's not a futures contract, okay? Because a futures contract is freaking expensive, right? So if I just traded this and I put in, I mean, I, I don't have to do 100 shares. I mean, I, I literally right now I could say I'm going to do, and, and I might talk about this tomorrow in class. I might do 50 shares of this now, and if it breaks the low, I'll do another 50 shares, and I'll wait, and another 50 shares, and I'll wait, and I'll build up maybe a maybe a one to 200 share position, and if this thing rips the way that I think it can, and we create some type of reversal pattern, there's my trade. So let's say that I own this, let's say I just own the stock around 60 bucks. Well, if it goes $60, and it goes back to... I don't know. I mean, this was our 2022 correction. So it went all the way back to 72. I mean, if we go there and I get a $12 move, okay? If I get a $12 move, if I have, uh, let's say I just have like, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm i going to at least get into, I probably need at least a 1% to 3% stake here. So if I get, let's get 1%. So if I allocate, uh, let's say 250 thousand dollars i allocate 2500 bucks so let's see what 2500 bucks buys me 2500 divided by 60 dollars share price i can buy uh right now i could buy 41 shares if i wanted one percent okay i think realistically as a as a way to play this longer term is this probably needs to be like a three to five percent trade for me because if i take three to five percent in this all right and, and i and i take three to five percent and this thing goes from 60 bucks and it goes up, you know, 20%. Now that's great on just owning the shares, but as I'm confident with the direction, I could also take long calls, I can trade options, I could do synthetic plays that reduce the buying power, and, and I can still have the ownership like I have 100 shares. But I could turn what is, you know, a 21% area, let's say, let's say 20% gain, I can probably juice that to like 40, 50% profit. Okay? And so if I have... Uh, let's say I put in, you know, I'll just keep the number simple. I put in 5%. If I put in 5% and I can juice that, you know, 50%, then that's a two and a half to 3% savings that I can make for my entire portfolio as a hedge, you know? So anyway, it's not perfect. Obviously I, it, you know, Forex is a leveraged market, so you can make a lot more money in Forex. But to me, the safer play is if you're short the yen, remember it's negative swap. If I'm long this instrument, it's it costs me nothing. That's the good thing, right? But does that mean I want to get long right now? Eh, maybe not. Not necessarily, okay? But I think having a little skin in the game right now wouldn't be terrible. If I did like tranches of 25, 50 shares, um, and then just wait. If I bought it now and I wait and this thing goes up to, I mean, if I take a $2,500 $2, position and I just say I buy 50 shares. So 50 shares... And that would be, uh, let's see, I make, let's say, what is that? $12 a share, 50 shares. I mean, I make $600, you know, but it's also, I don't know. It's just a safer way to trade it. Uh, if I want to trade Japanese and futures, uh, yen futures, that would be this. This is a little bit crazier. Okay. I don't want to have anything that's going to cost me a lot of money. This is going to cost me a lot of money. I've been watching traders for literally weeks and weeks and weeks, weeks and weeks and weeks. Tasty Trade talking about Japanese yen, Japanese yen. I'm taking a naked put, naked put, naked put. They've just been getting smoked on naked puts. Just, I mean, and that's the, the, the worst. I don't know if you've ever been assigned on a naked put or have a trade go against you. It is unlimited potential unless you're willing to take assignment. So, I mean, owning a futures contract, I'll just show you what this is going to cost. If I did yen futures right now, uh, let me go yen futures. Where's my yen at? Should be like 6J. There we go. There's my yen futures. If I said, and this is the hard part if I want to trade an option. If I went out to a position here, uh, we had a low around 0 0.006. Okay. So if I go out to August, and I say that we won't be below 0 0.006, and I sell a put. 
okay? This is what I want you to see. If I take this over here, you can see the numbers. This will allow me to make $43 a profit, okay? And my max risk would be $75,000. No thanks. Obviously, I'm not going to, I mean, this would have to go to zero for that to be all the risk, but it ties up $827. I only make 40 bucks on the trade and I would win, you know? So the best way to leverage this is if I was long a futures contract, but you're going to see how expensive that is. So if I want to buy that 60 right here so I could execute it any time, now you're going to see what's it going to cost me. I would have to be willing to risk $7,500 on that trade and... That's only going out to August of 2024. There is no way that I feel comfortable that this is the timing of my trade. There's no way, right? If I'm like, I, I, I promise that August 9th, the, gen, the Japanese yen is going to be stronger, stronger, stronger. There's no freaking way I'd believe that trade. And here's what's even crazier. If I wanted to go out farther, let's see how far I can go out. I can go to December of this year. Okay, and we'll say that by the end of the year, the Japanese yen is going to have its, it's going to have its day. So we go to 006 and we buy a call. Watch this. Okay, I can't even get it. There's no, not even a price there. If I buy, let me buy this. Give me, a, give me something. Give me some data. So it's going to take up eighty-seven hundred dollars of buying power. Um, I don't even know why it doesn't show a freaking. Uh, it doesn't show me data. Uh, let me see if I can get something here. Anything? Anything? All right, maybe this will this will probably update with live live prices tomorrow. Um, remind me if you're in my flex room or equities on man room, we'll look at this tomorrow. If I'm in the A1 trading session, um, jump in the chat and, and say, Hey, Chris, look at Japanese and futures, because I, I want to price, I want to see what this is going to cost. And again, this is if we're right. And if all I did was went long that contract, guess what I have to do with the long contract. If I buy the contract at 60 cents, okay, or it's, it's technically 0 0.006. If I buy it there and then I pay my premium. My break even might be way the fudge up here, which means I need price to not only be right, but I need it to be right by a big percent already just to cover my cost and then also go up on top of that by a certain time. See what I'm saying? It's not that easy. So eventually this trade will be good, eventually. But I think the better trade for me as far as low barriers to entry and low cost basis and not worrying about a bunch of crazy stuff like getting, you know, nickel and dime with negative financing would be get long the FXY and try to turn this into a couple thousand bucks. Because if we have an unraveling, awesome, right? I'm willing to take a one to, let's say a one to 5% risk and have this thing, you know, essentially give me like a 25 to 50% profit. I'm okay with that, right? If I take a 5% risk and I can make 2.5% for my entire portfolio, to me, that's a really good hedge on the yen. Safely without tying up a bunch of capital. As opposed to Forex where, I mean, I might get flashed out with intervention and we've got all sorts of spot exchanges that we can't trade and it's illiquid and it's nasty and it's ugly and it sucks to trade and it feels like you're chasing it. This would be, I'll just dollar cost average in, you know? So I will do a little bit more digging on FXI because um, I was long on this right here. We were long on FXY with a call option uh, and equities on demand. We bought this thing with a $60 call option and we had one trade that was a loser and one trade that was up like $5. So the one loser was like, it cost us maybe $1.50 to buy it. And then the other one, we probably paid about the same, but closed it out for like a five or $6 credit. Um, pretty good. You know, if I was in, 10 contracts, uh, that's not too bad. And one thing I could look at here for FXY is maybe this is an easier way to trade it. I just don't think the timing is now. So I'm, I'm just, I'm not interested in trying to get this right now. I think as we go into the new year or go into December, I might do a December, check this out. If I went into, everyone's joining so late. What's up with this? <laughs> All right, um, everyone that's coming in the last like five, 10 minutes, uh, the good thing is, is I'm recording the whole session, so I'll post this stuff. Um, but we're going to wrap up here in probably five or ten minutes, just so you know. So if you're coming in, I appreciate you being here. Um, but we've been going for an hour and 40 minutes. Uh, we spent about the first hour with uh, with Andrea Edgeful and talked about that with the, the financial dashboard. And then we're just talking macro stuff here. So um, everybody else is good. Yes, chat. Good. Okay. 
Okay, so uh, what I was going to say is this. If we get to December, December of 2024, I might look at a trade that takes me out to January 2026. Just saying. And why would I do that? And again, I, I would still be willing to own shares of FXY, but if I just did a long call option, if I look at this trade for the next year of 2026, again, I can still lose on the trade. doesn't guarantee I get it right. But if I buy, let's say we're still like, floating around and the, and the lowest price here is going to be around, you know, $58. Well, if I buy, uh, if I want to buy that $58 strike, I mean, I'm going to pay $10 for it. That's going to put my break even at 68. That's not a great trade because that's how costly it is. Now, because this is so far out, I'm going to pay a lot of money for that trade right now. But if I wait until the end of the year, this might be maybe instead of $10, it's trading for $6. So if I buy the 58 and then I'm, I'm going to break even at 64 and my my target point is 72. You know, I pay. I'll che I'll keep the number simple. Let's say that I'm I'm paying, um, you know, seven dollars for this trade, and I have eight dollars of upside. Well, that's a hundred percent gain on my call option. Okay, that's a hundred percent gain on my call option. More than that, because if I pay seven and I, and I close out for eight, that's a hundred percent upside in an instrument that only moves about fifteen to twenty percent. So I get the leverage with a potential 5x return if I do the call option. But I have to get direction right, and I have to get it right in a certain amount of time. And I think this is all very fair, but it's still going to be a calculated risk. So this trade, if I did it for, uh, I mean, I could look at five contracts, right? If I paid seven bucks for this, five contracts, that cost me $3,500 to take the trade. That's just over 1% risk, but that 1% could become a full 1%. If I double that for a 2% risk and that becomes a full 2%, I, it's a good trade, you know? And on top of that, if we see that the Japanese yen is getting stronger, the ripple effect from that of where the indexes might be, the reality check of the markets, the unraveling of the dollar, the gold trade, the Bitcoin trade, the who knows trade, all this stuff happens in the background. And I do think that it might be a scary environment, but there will be a lot of money to be made in that fear. Just throwing it out there. So this is big picture stuff. I don't think it's ready yet. But as I'm talking about direction right now, believe me, I'm watching for stuff like this to start showing better signs, better timing to maybe take some 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 trades. So I do think right now I could start the process with a little dollar cost averaging and FXY. To me, that's the safest way to trade it. It's not leveraged. I can put an allocated amount in, 1% or 2%, call it good. If I wanted to dollar cost average, I do another one or 2%. I'm good with that, right? Once I see that it's time to maybe guess where the timing is of the call options, I get more involved in that. And against that trade, I would just keep selling. I keep selling against it, selling against it, lowering my cost base. Instead of seven, I lower it to six. Now I paid $6 total. I make $8 total. I make over 100% return. Is that crazy or is that okay? Does that make sense? So big picture stuff, right? All right, cool. Um, all good, Jan. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, I just wanted to let everyone know, like, we're, we're kind of wrapping up here. So um, it's, it's almost 7 o'clock Eastern time. It's almost uh, 5 o'clock here. I think I'm good. Um, yeah, risk to reward is everything. It absolutely is. A good trade, some patience, some setups, you know, and also some awareness, you know. I, I Believe me, like, there's a lot of stuff to juggle when you're trading. I know that for me, my job right now is this portfolio right here with, I mean, all these accounts, all these positions, it's too much. I mean, if I look at all these positions, I know that I have a bunch of expirations coming May 17th, and this will probably drop by 30%. And then I'll do another chunk in maybe July or August, and it'll be reduced again. And I'm just like slowly, quarter by quarter, two to three months out, every 45 to 60 days, I'm just whittling down my portfolio, getting it more and more concentrated, trying to get a read on better directions, and I'm trying to put my money where it's going to be treated best. So to that point, if Roz is still in the room, uh, we did talk about gold and silver, but I didn't have a chance to talk about it right here, so I'll do this. Gold, and I looked at gold or silver today. I looked at silver. I, I like this level at 20. Um, I, lo I love this level at 26, okay? However, this trade... I, I think could be very volatile um, over the next, you know, six to 12 months. Now, I would like to think that since gold already made this crazy radical run, 
silver is still not there yet okay my concern with silver right now is why isn't silver doing better right i mean if you compare silver and gold gold is outperforming by quite a bit so recently uh, if you look at this oh i mean and this is this is very choppy but if you look at recently we have been making higher lows this is gold versus silver so gold has been slightly outperforming silver gold's been slightly outperforming silver just by a little bit now for this to show that we're getting the silver trade correct this structure would need to break and i don't know if that's going to happen but i certainly hope that it does because by this level or this level if i was long silver and it's outperforming gold by a landslide then i'm taking profit down here because that's probably where gold gets its groove back um that being said i'm long both i don't think you can have silver by itself without having gold because i don't know if silver is just the greatest thing ever or if gold is the greatest thing ever but if i look at both charts i think the scary thing about gold is now that we've made this multi-year range breakout i think the scary thing is we don't know where the top is and and this has technically been a pretty straightforward move this has been one two and this might be wave three right here right and this could be wave four and we might have a wave five that gets us another big push to the upside and if i go back deeper than that that's a, that's a daily time frame let me go back deeper and make sure i'm not missing something here so gold i mean i can't really i can't count this i can't say that we're oh it's a wave one right here wave one two three four five i mean that would make sense i guess but then we're gonna re we're gonna take back all that move retest the high and then go longer term up that would be a tremendous decline in gold if we had that move coming first, starting from that low in 2014 or 15. Anything can happen. But I think right now, if this is one, two, three, pause on four, wave five is still coming. Man, I'm excited for gold. Gold still has a lot of upside potential. Uh, I bought GLD. I'm looking for opportunities to get long gold futures, but I got to trade it carefully because futures contracts are freaking expensive. So I'm just doing credit spreads. I'm not doing naked puts. I'm not doing broken. I'm just... I'm just buying GLD. That makes it easy for me. That way I can just hold it. I can lower my cost bases a little bit. Uh, I can do long options as well on GLD and SLV. So that's my way of trading it. I like futures for, for credit spreads, but I like GLD and SLV for ownership. So here's SLV. Okay, so if I connect the lows here on SLV, we have some support. And I could see silver. If it just, you know, kind of, fumbles around here for a little bit um i just like this trade one two i mean come on wave three maybe this is going to be a wave three in a channel like this right and that's fine but the problem is like man wave three usually is pretty aggressive so i thought when we had this move and we finally broke out here that this would be time for wave three to get some legs and that's to me that's wave three if we pull back wave four wave five is all the way up here so I've got some big plans for silver, and I do want to own some SLV. So I have some credit spreads, I have some long options, I have some synthetic plays, I got some naked puts, and I also have some ownership that could probably come in the next uh, couple of weeks. So I did like a 27 by 26 credit spread. I'm going to take the assignment and take uh, 500 shares of silver, allocate 10 grand. That's about you know again three to five percent between gold and silver. I like I like both of those allocations. So. All right, cool, everybody. Um, I will let you go. Any other questions? Couple minutes for final Q and A. Uh, this whole session has been recorded. It's about an hour and forty minutes. Uh, I will save this recording. I'm happy to post this out there on YouTube. Right? It's not like this is like, oh, you, you guys all paid for this session. It's like I'm happy to post this um, because you came in and took the poll and attended. I'm happy just to give it to you personally. That's fine too. I don't really care. But I think this is good information to get, you know, get everybody involved. So I will, I'll do this. I'll post it in uh, my YouTube, or I'm sorry, my Discord channel um, under analysis. And I will post this on YouTube as like a big, you know, whatever. I'll, I'll put it out some like 2024, 2025 prediction video, make it kind of timeless. And I think this will be a good session. And I'll, I'll splice this portion. Like, so the Andre Edgeful stuff, I'll, 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 you know, keep that in here for, for this whole recording. But if you want just like the bigger picture stuff I put on YouTube, then I'll, I'll take this like macro. Okay. All right, cool. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Arthur. Thanks, Jan. Nice to see everybody. And um, have a great rest of the day.
Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks. Bye-bye.